on this edition of In the Life. A lesbian explorer treks to the ends of the earth, promoting self-defense in the battle against cancer. And leather as a lifestyle. Listen more on In the Life, America's gay and lesbian news magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Richard M. and Peggy Danziger. Agnes Gund and Daniel Shapiro. Fred P. Hochberg and Tom Healy. William J. Resnick. Rick Wyland. The Rainbow Endowment. The Reed Williams Foundation. The Mitchell Gold Company in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice. Thank you. Bolia Vineyard, celebrating over 100 years of passionate winemaking and proudly supporting In the Life. Bolia Vineyard, Rutherford, California. And the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life and our Gay Pride episode. I'm Katherine Linton. To celebrate Gay Pride, we'll look at some extraordinary stories that highlight the diversity of the gay and lesbian community. On this program, we'll profile a woman who exemplifies commitment to her community. Correspondent Mason Essif brings us the story of Nancy Lanou, who, having just won her own battle against cancer, was confronted with the loss of her life partner to the disease. Through strength and determination, Lanou turned her own adversity into a crusade for others. Having professional, compassionate touch uh, seems to be part of the healing process for a lot of cancer survivors. Correspondent Hal German reports on a marginalized segment of the gay community that's fighting for acceptance. And Andy Hum on how gay liberation cultivated a cult classic. But first, let's turn to family matters. As our viewers know, stories about gay families have been a regular feature on In the Life. For this episode, we turn our lens to the sons and daughters of gay parents. For a kid, having a gay or lesbian parent can bring distinct challenges as well as unusual rewards. For our feature story, we look at the issues these children face and an organization that is offering them support. We have six children together, ages from 20 on down to six. Four of them are biologically mine, um, two are biologically Satara's. We brought everybody together, not to say that it hasn't had its ups and downs. It's the Brady Bunch. Yeah, so how's your yearbook project going? Pretty good. Well, I have two moms. It's, it's a normal thing. I'm not eating with my hands, mother. Not really, so how are you? I've been living with them for 10 years, you know. I mean, it's like I'm kind of used to it. I think the only time it becomes an issue is when it's someone else's problem. Unfortunately, for the millions of kids growing up in the U.S. with a lesbian or gay parent, it is often someone else's problem. My friend's uncle, my mom, nails, and I don't like it. Our friends like still make fun of gay people. We're like, we don't feel comfortable telling them. We just kind of like combine our two moms into one. Because like sometimes we're talking about one mom, sometimes talking about another one. Being a child of a gay or lesbian or bisexual transgender parent is very similar, I think, to growing up as a gay person in that you unconsciously are learning all of these defenses and you don't even know it's happening. When you're walking with your two dads and you see kids from your school coming, you step away from them. Wanting to just kind of edit your life a little bit or not be embarrassed. There was this one girl in um, my elementary school that I had considered a friend. I told her that my parents are gay and later on that week she said to me, my mom told me that if your parents are gay then you're gonna be gay and I don't want to be your friend anymore because of that, and I got really hurt by that. To counteract the taunts, stigma, and isolation, six young adults with lesbian or gay parents came together in 1990 to form Collage, which is headquartered in San Francisco. 
Our mission is to serve any daughter or son or person with a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning parent. Collage is here so that all of the children who are growing up can feel like they have a home of people who understand their experiences and share their experiences of their family background. Well, collage stands for um, children of lesbian and gay environments or something like that. I don't know what the E stands for. We have 30 chapters around the country and um, about 30 prospective chapters in the pipeline. We have all kinds of stuff on our website and discussion groups and support groups and pen pal programs and newsletters led by young people for young people. We get between five and 10,000 calls and emails and letters every year. There are still people who call here all the time who are so glad to hear about us because they never ever knew that there was one other person in the whole world who had a gay parent. They thought they were the only one. I mean, really, in 2001, that still happens. I grew up in San Francisco in the 70s with a gay dad and a lesbian mom. I can switch from potluck mode to drag queen mode in a heartbeat. It's really not a big difference to me. We're just parenting a kid like hundreds of thousands of other parents across the country are just parenting their kids, you know? And when we go to collage, that's what it feels like. It's just normal. Of all the muck and discrimination and general ignorance and misinformation that's out there, you can sort of boil it down to about three points for kids who have queer parents. That our parents sexually abuse us, that because our parents are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, we will be as well, and that we will be socially stigmatized to a degree that we will not be able to function normally in society. All the social science studies that have been done on us to date show that we grow up to be fine. But I do believe that we are affected by homophobia. I do believe that having to grow up in a world that is unsupportive of our families and our culture and our, our lives hurts us. And I think that it would be really great if society was less homophobic so that we could blossom even more into the full potential of, of our own true selves. Your lunch is made and it's in here. Okay. When Gabriel first went to school, there was name calling. He was just in kindergarten and he was barely five years old and a second grade boy called him gay because he was in the bathroom with his best friend. My reaction was to become an activist, and we immediately met with the principal. We um, organized a workshop for the teachers. We did a parent education night at the school. Schools need to have a zero tolerance policy for slurs. One of the biggest things that I hear from kids is that they hear fag and dyke all the time. And every time they hear it, it's like a wound. It's just so painful and it goes completely unchecked. We just felt that we wanted our kids to have a sense of pride in, in their families and to just have it be kind of normalized. I mean, we have African American Heritage Month and Cinco de Mayo, and we wanted an event. It's an amazing thing when you think about a public school having a gay pride assembly. A lot of schools do cultural celebrations around different identity groups. You know, there are also great ways to do different pride celebrations. We really wanted it to be an affirming, positive event, and uh, yeah, I think that it has been. When gay families are brought together, they often discover they have similar challenges and ways to support each other. One of the things that was most fulfilling for me coming to Collage was meeting other people whose dads had had either died from AIDS or who had or who were HIV positive because my dad is HIV positive and it was something that I was of course in great pain around. Brianna was adopted by my late partner Kevin. She was just over a year old when Kevin and I met and we started living together as a family and then um, Kevin got very sick 
uh, with HIV. Brianna was, you know, right by my side and Kevin's side throughout his whole disease process. Brianna was five when Kevin died. Uh, about a year after that, I met Greg. It's certainly colored that aspect of her childhood, but it also was an opportunity for her to experience the depth of love that she had for Kevin and his love for her and how much incredible joy he received from her presence by his side. I mean, it was amazing to watch. Um, and I know that that has, has enabled her to be as open and loving and trusting with people as she is. When I came to Collage and I met other people who had been through it and who had survived it and who were able to support me and who showed me that I would be able to survive it as well, that was very, very meaningful for me. And that has been a gift that I have tried to pass on. When I ask a, a child, what have you learned from growing up in a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender home? What they say is, I have learned to be a stronger person from dealing with difference. I have learned to have a greater sense of empathy and a larger commitment to social justice for all people because of the discrimination that I have faced in my own life. They're growing up into these incredibly vibrant, fascinating, interesting, strong, compassionate people who are going off to their own schools and their own careers and starting their own families and, and spreading all of that change. I mean, I, I think it's incredible. And I think in 20 years or 40 years, we're gonna see an America that's totally different because of that. A typical day in our household starts at 5.30 a.m. when Michael leaves for work. At 6.30, I make breakfast, pack lunches, and get the kids ready for school. Adam's bus leaves at 7.30. Rosa drops Marianna at daycare on the way to school, and I drive Madison to hers. As heads of a family, John and I take part in the same overwhelming and rewarding ritual that millions of Americans go through each day. But society's traditional support structures don't always extend to families like ours. Organizations like Family Pride are trying to change that. With programs like parenting groups, advocacy training, and a local schools project, Family Pride provides information and support to parents like us around the world. For a link to Family Pride, log on to the In The Life website at inthelifetv.org. We're, We're the, the Galuchios, Galuchios and you're, and you're watching, watching In, In The Life. Life. In the mid-1970s, an over-the-top stage production called the Rocky Horror Show made a journey from London hit to Broadway flop to feature film, where it quickly bombed. Then it was suggested that the movie about a singing, dancing, transvestite alien might attract the late-night urban crowd, and the experiment was tried out at the Waverly Theater in the heart of New York's Greenwich Village and a new millennium, Rocky Horror recently returned to Broadway. How do you do? Looking at the decade that spawned the Rocky Horror phenomenon, it's clear that gay and sexual liberation was the fuel igniting those midnight crowds. When it came out, it, it didn't really come out because no one knew what to do with it, so they kind of buried it at Fox, and someone started sneaking it to, um, art houses and campuses and gay community found it. The movie came out at the peak of an era of gay sexual liberation. It was an exciting time to be gay. And uh, also, uh, experimentations in gender were sort of prevalent in the media. Rocky Horror came into my life in late 1976. <laughs> and I became part of that original group of people that started the now famous audience participation. I've seen it for sure over 2,000 times. Sal Piero was really the driving force. He was so into it. And he would go on stage before the screening and announce to everybody what you have to do. He would ask if there are any virgins in the audience, you know, people who'd never seen Rocky Horror before. And he would tell you what this is all about. Participation started gradually. It happened without us realizing it was going on. 
In the beginning, everybody would just sing along with the songs. And then there was a kindergarten teacher who sat in the front row of the balcony, and he was the first person to shout at the screen. And when Janet put the newspaper on top of her head in the rain, he yelled out, buy an umbrella, you cheap bitch. And everybody laughed. And then it became like a race, like, oh, that was really clever. What could we say next time? And then we found out that it was happening in other theaters, because somebody would come to the Waverly and take it to another theater, and then they'd start doing it. And Rocky just took off. It was, it was a phenomenon. Once you saw the movie with the cult audience, which was basically disenfranchised people living on the edge, a lot of gay kids who were just coming out for the first time, it really was an inspiring experience because obviously they drew a lot from the message of the movie, which was don't dream it, be it. It was a very big gay audience going to see Rocky. The group of friends that I went with, we were all gay and we all went to see Rocky Horror because it was like the thing to do. Once word got out that all the, this audience participation was happening and it was re achieving this kind of uh, strange cult status, it attracted more people. So the straight audiences came. And because it was the West Village, it was a really good mix going on. Everybody just wanted to get into those high heels and fishnets. And, and he was sexy. And he was like a, a good fairy of libido. He just kind of awakened the sexual spirit inside everybody. And just a sweet transvestite. There was a feeling in the theater that of, of absolute freedom. People were like, you know, I'm going to get up and do my thing. You would actually think that people kind of outed themselves within the theater, you know, the, the, the gay people, and the straight people were loving it. And this was only the mid-70s. Fast forward 25 years, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show has claimed its own unrivaled place in film history with 20th Century Fox staking that claim in a new anniversary DVD. And with a second New York stage try, producers are betting that in the new millennium, Broadway is finally ready for the gender-bending, sexually charged Rocky Horror. Directed by Christopher Ashley with choreography by Jerry Mitchell, the new troupe of aliens and unsuspecting humans are headed by Alice Ripley, Jared Emick, Raul Esparza, Sebastian Lacaz, Daphne Rubin Vega, rock star Joan Jett, Leah Delaria. And Tom Hewitt as Dr. Frank N. Furter. Also on board to help Broadway regulars navigate the wild plot is Dick Cavett well, as the now, narrator. This is the Rocky Horror Show. We were two weeks into rehearsal before anybody broke the news to me that I was not the one who got to wear ladies' panties and garters. I'm stuck with the narrator's role. The Broadway production today really doesn't disappoint the diehard fans. They stay faithful enough so that you're satisfied by what they're doing, and yet they reinvent it enough so that it's not just the same old thing. We've updated it in a lot of ways and made it way more turn of the century, new millennium stuff. Yeah, just casting me as Eddie, I mean, is, is, is one example. Leah Delaria is playing the meatloaf role, and she's also playing Dr. Scott, so she's playing two male roles. It just sort of latches onto the absurdity of sex and sexuality and uh, explores that in a very funny way. You liked it, didn't you? 25-year-old producer Jordan Roth was born just about the time kids first began lining up for Rocky Horror. Rocky seems to have been a really seminal experience for just about everybody. These messages of don't dream it, be it, invent yourself, celebrate yourself, be the sort of star of your life, those messages were really important. I see you shiver with anticipation. 
whatever that movie says, especially to lonely kids, you know, has turned out to be something that I'm quite proud of. Don't Dream It, Be It is a great message, and at a time when kids are having some sexual ambiguity and all the kids that are left out or don't know what they're doing are a little bit too odd, they can put on this outrageous garb and, and go somewhere where they're accepted for who they want to be. That's why the movie is celebrated among teenagers. Let's do the time. Because it's, it's at that point in people's lives when they need their identities validated and um, welcomed. That message spoke to a whole generation, and it continues to speak to new generations. We've still got a lot of work to do around the way people view us, uh, you know, in queerdom. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, bibbidi bobbidi boo you know. We, we, still, we still have a lot of work to do about that, but we have come quite a way. Case in point, Rocky Horror on Broadway. On this month's In the News, at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, gays, lesbians, and straight allies rallied against Fred Phelps, creator of the God Hates Fags website, and his supporters. Fred Phelps was protesting in Madison because the school board elected an LGBT youth advocate to uh, help students deal with issues uh, regarding homosexuality. And when I found out, I immediately told everyone I knew Mal and other local activists decided to put together a fundraiser modeled after one organized by Keith Orr in Ann Arbor, Michigan, earlier this year. Well, Fred was coming to Ann Arbor to protest the um, Queer Visibility Week that the University of Michigan uh, does every year. At the same time, of course, he always um, likes to protest wherever he goes, um, churches that he considers too liberal, bars um, where... Um, gays and lesbians congregate. Hearing that Phelps was planning to picket outside the Out Bar, a gay establishment that he owned, Orr decided to do something different. We decided, however, if he's going to be out there spewing his hate, we were going to take advantage of that to build our community and help fund uh, one of our organizations. So the idea is that for every minute he's out there, he's going to help us raise money. Orr came up with the idea for a pledge drive. For every minute that Phelps and his supporters picketed the out bar, individuals could pledge a certain amount of money that would go to a local gay organization. The longer Phelps picketed, the more money was raised. By the time um, all was said and done, we were raising $125 every minute. So we ended up raising $7,500 for Washtenaw Rainbow Action Project in about a 50-hour pledge drive. In Madison, Orr's concept was quickly embraced. So far, we've raised, online, we've collected over $2,000. We're about to reach the $3,000 mark. We'll probably do it this afternoon. Unfortunately, there are those who have not lived in a world of acceptance and whose ignorance leads to words and acts of hate. It is critical that we speak out in a loud, clear voice and say to them, your hate is not welcome here. That's we rally right. today to counter the signs and slogans of hatred and oppression. The money raised from the Madison event, estimated at $6,000, went to the local chapter of GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, for a youth scholarship fund that will help high school students further their education in LGBT studies. Similar fund drives are now underway in Las Vegas, Santee, California, San Antonio, Portland, Maine, and Fred Phelps' hometown of Topeka, Kansas. I'm Elon Harris, and you're watching End the Line. Still to come on End the Life. A lesson in leather, and a three-month, 1,700-mile trek across the Antarctic. But first... Over the years, In the Life has explored health topics of interest to both gay men and lesbians, ranging from AIDS to hepatitis to cancer. Next, we introduce one Chicago woman who not only fought back against her own bout with cancer, but now fights for the health and well-being of others.
getting my arms between me and danger. With a black belt in karate, Nancy Lanou knows how to defend herself in threatening situations. But back in the spring of 1987, the danger came from within. I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer on my 35th birthday. Nancy had always been athletic, but it wasn't until her mid-20s that she found out she had a talent for the martial arts. I was in love with it from the very first day. After moving to Chicago in 1984, Nancy and her partner Jeanette Pappas started plans to open the women's gym. It was a place where lesbians congregated and felt welcomed and comfortable, and I had a very public role in my job. Despite this and her remarkable ability to lead self-defense classes, Nancy felt alone in her battle against cancer. I really did not know any young women. I didn't know any lesbians with breast cancer. Nancy fought her disease as aggressively as she knew how, with a mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, and she survived. But striking power coming down. What? But for Nancy, cancer would continue to be a danger. If not for her, then for the one she loved. It was only about a year and a half after my experience that Jeanette was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which was not at all the same kind of situation um, as mine. Pancreatic cancer is usually, and it was in her case, also discovered very late um, when it was essentially not treatable. For Nancy, it was time to say goodbye to the woman who nursed her through her disease. Oh, it's, it's still painful. It's a long time ago. But um, she was a great, she was a great woman, great inspiration to me, and um, I still really miss her. You got a stress management appointment today? Yes, I do. I'm not sure. Okay. After Jeanette's death, Nancy transformed the women's gym into a women's day spa and eventually opened a dojo, a karate studio. She named the businesses Thousand Waves. That's based on a, on a Zen saying that is one wave sets thousands in motion. It's very strong and compassionate. Respect and acceptance and humility. Creative, strong, compassionate. Friends counted on that compassion when they asked her to help create the Lesbian Community Cancer Project. As we formulated our official mission statement, it was to provide direct services and support to women with cancer and their self-identified families, um, and to advocate um, in public forums for change and um, it, with regard to lesbian health. And there was always a dual mission of advocacy, prevention, and support services. One of those services is a buddy program. Nancy's current buddy is Deborah Lang, who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1998 and is still receiving treatments. I can look back at Nancy and say, OK, she got back doing what she loves. Um, perhaps there's, there's hope. Even though our situations aren't exactly the same, perhaps there's hope for me to get back to a life that I can once again embrace. So what's bothering you today? In addition to ongoing support groups, clients of the Lesbian Community Cancer Project are also given free access to all of Nancy's spa facilities, including therapeutic massages. Oh, it's been wonderful. Um, I have weekly massages, just about weekly, when I'm not in the hospital from the cancer. Having professional, compassionate touch uh, seems to be part of the healing process for a lot of cancer survivors. In January of 2001, the Lesbian Community Cancer Project celebrated its 10th anniversary with this huge event in Southside Chicago. For the more than 1,000 guests who attended, it was a time to look back in pride to what Nancy and her friends had accomplished. You will find young people, old people, black people, white people, brown people, um, handicapped people, anyone in the lesbian, gay, trans community usually finds their way here. While sampling the food and spirits, attendees wander through exhibits, bid at silent auction, or dance the night away. <laughs> the 
The $85,000 raised at the 2001 event cover many of the costs of LCCP services. That money allows us to run free clinics on the north side and the south side of town, and we're hoping to expand to the west side. We serve over 400 women annually, and we give free gynae exams, free mammograms. And what's nice about that is that it's the environment where you go and you're talking to a woman who understands that you're a woman. You don't necessarily get pumped about whether or not you're on what kind of birth control and whether or not you need to get a pregnancy test. Every year, LCCP recognizes community leaders with the Coming Out Against Cancer Awards. But most are there to celebrate the work of LCCP. It's very important work, and um, no one else is doing it in our city. And it's the only agency that has the word lesbian in its title that I know of that is um, such a public institution. And, and I think that's something that all Chicago lesbians feel proud of. Nancy also takes pride in her partner, Sarah Ludden. They began dating shortly after cancer claimed Jeanette's life. Starting a relationship with somebody whose partner had recently died within the last year was unique, and we needed to really talk about that. She needed to, needed to grieve and have the space and the freedom to miss Jeanette and grieve her. Sarah shares Nancy's talents in the martial arts and is a black belt herself. I was really in love with Nancy, and I really knew I wanted to be with her and really was ready to commit to a relationship. Nancy says that it was scary getting involved with someone after a mastectomy. Entering into an intimate relationship with somebody with a changed body was uh, just another factor. But she's wonderful and made that possible, made me feel brave enough to undertake that. In October of 2000, Nancy and Sarah celebrated their 10th year together. When you fall in love and you meet somebody that seems very compatible and you're very excited about turning your life away from a long extended period of pretty unremitting sadness, um, I went for it. For this month's In the Arts, a look at three of the films featured at the 25th anniversary San Francisco International Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, the oldest and largest of its kind. A French road movie called The Adventures of Felix opens the fest with the story of a young HIV positive Arabic Frenchman on a quest. En route, Felix stops at his clinic for a quick checkup. Ça fait beaucoup avaler, c'est sûr. Mais moi, j'avais plus de T4. Dans ces cas-là, il faut mettre la dose. Ah, plus du tout, du tout Ah non, plus du tout, du tout Mais je tiens le coup, hein. Ah, regardez, ce que j'ai l'air moi. Canadian Leia Poole's first English language film, Lost and Delirious, tells a tale of passion and discovery in a girl's boarding school. Uh -uh. She gets serious. Nightmares. <laughs> Gay pride is a celebration of many things, including, of course, sexuality. Next, we explore one segment of the lesbian and gay community whose alternate sexuality alarms some and intrigues others, those for whom leather is more than a fashion statement. Bondage, domination, the sexual exchange of power. Those who seek out these activities can be gay or straight. In fact, some of the largest leather groups cater to heterosexuals. But in this report, we meet some of those in the gay community who not only wear leather, they live it. 
In New York City, one week before the Gay Pride Parade each year, one segment of the community begins the party early. At the Folsom Street East Fair, these men and women gather to celebrate a common bond, their identification with leather. It's a great gathering of the tribe where we have vendors and community groups and entertainment and raise money for various charities. The leather community has become an increasingly visible presence at LGBT events dating back to the 1987 March on Washington. What's the allure? This 1995 short film offers a peek inside the gay leather world and a clue to the answer. Leather armor and gloves, thin, tight, and a cap sends a message, cuts through a lot of games, hankies, armbands, keys. You know what you're getting right from the start. Sex. It's leather sex, that energy that two folks that are having a power exchange are aware of. It's communicating openly about your fantasies, your desires. I mean, leather sex, for me, is kind of edgy. Sex and power and passion. It's just a different form of, of loving, really. It's just a non-traditional way of loving. But to outsiders, the leather community remains a world synonymous with sadomasochism. And that's where the problems begin. I believe one of the biggest misconceptions people have about leather folk is that we're only about pain or whips and chains. There are many, many various parts that go into a leather SM scene. And it, sometimes it's not about pain at all. It can be about uh, fantasy or, or fetish. The most important thing for people to know about the SM leather fetish community and, and the people who practice SM is that we aren't violent people and that we aren't abusive people. In fact, we're very responsible. We try to go about our sexuality in a responsible way. Still, it is a form of sexuality that has had a hidden history, but not anymore. This is the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago. Its executive director is Joseph Bean. Because the world is trying so hard to make leather folk believe they're wrong. We're here to maintain the artifacts of leather lives and to validate the existence of a leather community. The collection traces the history of gay leather clubs and contests, art and literature, including the first mainstream publication that catered, however subtly, to a leather-friendly adult readership. That publication was Justice Weekly, a periodical about crime and legal punishment, with a friendship section in the back, the earliest straight and gay leather personal ads. But they would say things like, docile gentleman living in New York wishes to meet one or more more powerful men in the same area who find the subjects of this magazine interesting. And scanning those ads through the decades is spectacular history of sexual liberty, a spectacular history of leather sex. Today, that history has a symbol, the leather flag. Created by author and educator Tony de Blas, its blue, black, and white stripes with a red heart has been adopted by leather clubs and organizations around the world. Whatever you think the colors are and whatever you think they mean, which for me that means a rallying point. Now you can be very subtle about telling the world you're into leather just by seeing that all four of those colors are well represented in your car, costume, living room. They look around, leather folk will say, hmm, one of us. Among the most visible leather organizations today are those which seek to educate adults how to engage safely in leather sex. None is better known than GMSMA, the gay male SM activists. Their credo, safe, sane, and consensual play. Everybody has something deep down inside that they, they are afraid to express. And what we many times offer people is a way to play where they know that they'll be fine the next day. Was it safe? Does it seem that the people were aware of whatever they were doing and therefore could it have been approached sanely? And was it consensual? If the answer to any of those is no, 
then it is not what the leather archives or the leather community uh, would represent themselves to be doing. And I believe in safe, sane, and consensual. Um, I also think we need to add fun to that. But when one lesbian couple, Sarah Humble and Glenda Ryder, opened a space in Baltimore where adults could learn and experiment with safe leather play, the city shut them down as adult entertainment, likening them to a strip club. Adult entertainment, by the city of Baltimore's definition, is basically any touching, any touching. Anything that appeals to the purient interest, which about rules out Home Depot for some of our friends. We didn't have a liquor on premises, and there was no money exchanging hands for, that, for those play services. Um, we thought that we were not adult entertainment. Humble and Ryder enlisted the help of the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, met with city council members, and organized a letter-writing campaign to the mayor. The result? The city backed down. And the good thing with Baltimore City is that we've learned how to do it right. We've learned how to mobilize our community. We've learned how to talk to local officials and how to educate them that what our, our educational and social groups are doing is worthwhile. Yet even with their increased visibility, many who live the leather lifestyle complain that within the broader gay community, they sometimes feel like second-class citizens, a minority within a minority. It's tough enough when you, when you realize you're gay and you come out in, into the gay scene. When there's something else lurking within you and you realize that, oh, wow, I, I think I'm, I'm turned on to leather, that, that's a second coming out. And again, the criticism that because of its edgy sexuality, the leather community hinders political progress for all gays and lesbians. One sore spot, last year's Millennium March. Yay, leather man. Many felt March organizers had discouraged a leather presence in Washington in an attempt to present a more mainstream view of gays and lesbians to the media and the world. I was very saddened by that. There's a, a saying within the gay community that our diversity is our strength. And we want to remind them that they're fighting to be who they are, we're fighting to be who we are, and to feel comfortable to be who we are inside and not to put on a camouflage just to blend in the way everyone wants us to be. Privacy rights will be good for all of us. Uh, sexual freedom and freedom from discrimination on the basis of whatever connection to sex will be good for all of us. And we have to use that solidarity. We have to find that solidarity. Or we really cannot advance into the next millennium the way we could. What no one disputes is the leather community's clout when it comes to fundraising for gay and lesbian charities. In San Francisco, at the largest and best known gathering of the Klan, attendees to the annual Folsom Street Fair last year raised more than a quarter of a million dollars. Six foot four and debonair, emerald eyes and thick black hair. New York's smaller version of Folsom also raises thousands for groups like the Anti Violence Project. In the last few years, we've been a beneficiary of funds from some of the activities, including Folsom Street East, that GMSMA puts together. Just as other folks in the LGBT community are very interested in issues of violence, so are people in the SM and leather community. There is no difference. The leather community's political activism is also growing, with the creation of an annual Leather Leadership Conference. You can call it minority, because it's clearly not a majority of this country, just like gays and lesbians are not a majority. But it's a significant minority, and it needs to be respected. We are not going away. By being ignored, we will not be left out. Our final segment is about Anne Bancroft, no, not the actress who immortalized Mrs. Robinson in the movie The Graduate. This Anne Bancroft is an adventurer of a different sort, who has laid her own claim to fame as a celebrated explorer. In 1986, she was the only female member of a team that dog sledded 1,000 miles through Canada to the North Pole. Seven years later, as an out lesbian, she led a woman's expedition to the South Pole, 660 miles and 67 days on skis. And last year, she set a new goal for herself. On November 13, 2000, Bancroft and expedition partner Lee Varnison 
set out to break a world record as the first women to cross Antarctica on foot. The two women used skis, cleats, and sails to make their way across this forbidding and foreign landscape. They pulled sleds that weighed 250 pounds full of food and equipment and endured temperatures as low as 30 degrees below zero with winds gusting up to 100 miles per hour. They made history 94 days and 1,717 miles later. Anne and Leave shot this remarkable video footage themselves. Being on this trip and, and trying to describe it is uh, what we saw and what we felt seeing all of that is really hard because um, in, in 97 days, we saw so much variety. Most people think it's a blue, white, boring, flat place, but we travel on glaciers. The plateau is different than the glaciers. The construction of the snow or the makeup of the snow and ice is different every day. The lighting is so astounding it's changing during the day. And when that lighting changes in such an enormous place, when you're this little speck, it changes your whole surroundings. An extraordinary day was Christmas Day, and we had been hoping to sail. It was snowing on and off, which is very unusual in Antarctica. And uh, so it was very hard to distinguish what was ground and what was sky. It was, you know, enshrouding us. The wind picked up in the afternoon, and we got so excited that we packed up everything within uh, 40 minutes, I think and we were hooked into our sails, and we started to sail, but it was still the whiteout. And then the sun came out and burst through some of that white, and uh, it, was, it was magic. However, not every day was Christmas. Some days were extraordinarily difficult. Their fingers and noses were numb from frostbite, and the terrain was often treacherous. When we started the trip, and we were going up the glacier, and, and the snow was quite deep, and our sleds were 267 pounds, you know, and I'm weighing in at, at uh, 130. You know, that's, it was hard. Uh, and you think, how am I going to do this? You have these moments of, you know, what I call the heart thumpers, and you realize that you're extremely isolated. So, you know, we got into very difficult areas, and we, you know, would come back and we'd say, yeah, if we did get hurt here, it would be very hard to get rescued. I mean, you recognize those kinds of things. This was Anne and Leif's first expedition together. These two women, one lesbian and one straight, grew up on separate continents, but they shared a childhood dream of growing up to be explorers. Day 74. Dang. Eight day, the eighth day without wind. And we pull. Oh, we have to pull, and it's hard. I think it took me only a day or two that I really felt that we were sister spirits or sister souls, because we had this kind of common uh, experience from our kids. I was reading the same books in Oslo, like Anne did in St. Paul. We just got to know each other two and a half years ago. And um, uh, Leave wrote me in 1993. I had just returned from Antarctica. She was about to embark on a solo expedition, very similar route to the one we had just completed, and was interested in um, knowing about wind direction, et cetera, for a variety of reasons. Just you talk to everybody you can before you go. Um, and I knew I wanted to return to this remarkable continent. So I sort of stuffed her number away and I thought, I need to meet this woman for one reason or another. One, because I want to perhaps travel with her. If she's crazy enough to go by herself, that's just what I'm looking for. Well, I didn't know uh, that Anne was a lesbian before I actually came into her house and Pam. And, and I met Pam. And, uh, but, but by then, uh, I had met her, I talked to her, and uh, we had exchanged mail or, or, or letters. So I had, I had a positive feeling. And to me, it was more important uh, that she had a good relationship with her partner than that, that she actually was a lesbian. Because going on an expedition like that, it kind of uh, can, can affect the expedition if the person you go with uh, has a bad relationship. She has a good sense of humor, and it's fun to be with her. And uh, some days was really depressing. Uh, the wind did not come, and we had uh, to work hard to pull the sledges. And we said to ourselves that we're, today I'm depressed. So we put up the video camera and put up our mouth harps and made some jokes. We don't talk a lot on these journeys. We've got face masks on, the wind is blowing, we're in single file. 
you're exhausted. Uh, they're not elements that are conducive to conversation anyway. And it's, it's a long, long journey. So I always say that we have lots of friends that we climb and kayak with and do outdoor endeavors that are very skilled. But they're very clear that they don't have the personality to go on a 100-day expedition. And we do. We, d we revel in the fact that we will have this time away. It feels like a privilege to us. And in fact, the time went very fast. Preparing for a trip like this is grueling work. In addition to securing endorsements, getting supplies, and testing equipment, there is the physical aspect of the training, which takes each woman up to six hours a day. In the warmer months, when there's no snow on the ground, Anne runs for two to four hours, dragging tires to simulate the weight of her sled. The outdoors is her gym. She strengthens and tones by chopping all of the wood she uses to heat her house, and by canoeing in a nearby river. As former school teachers, both Bancroft and Arneson are dedicated to using their adventures to inspire young people, and girls especially, to follow their dreams. They are working in partnership with schools and educators to bring the lessons of their journeys to a global classroom through the internet. I used to be an elementary school teacher and a high school coach. In 85, when I uh, was chosen to go on an expedition to the North Pole, I took a sabbatical, and that sabbatical has extended to now. So. Uh, I, n I never returned to the formal classroom, in part because I realized that I could do these expeditions and still be a teacher. My classroom would just be a bit broader and uh, have more flexibility. My kids would be not just my 30 kids. They would be uh, classrooms all over the country and then now uh, in a global setting. Sandra, Leslie, please. No, this is Anne. When we were on the ice, we communicated through a satellite phone. Every day we would give a report, which then went on the website, utilizing our voices. It is day 30, uh, the 13th of December. We woke to 18 below and... I mean, it's just phenomenal, the way in which we could be so remote and still feel very um, intimate with our audience and have such a large audience. This has been a life process, and concretely, it's been 11 years in planning the Traverse, so I have needed positive voices, whether it's coming from my partner Pam, whether it's coming from what I call my inner circle of really good friends that, that knows me, uh, and sometimes it comes from kids, because kids are still so optimistic. They don't look at me as a woman or somebody that they perceive as small. They're just like, that's a cool adventure, go. And I can get energized by that. Bancroft and Arneson completed their expedition in February, making history as the first women to cross the entire Antarctic landmass on foot. Since their return, they've been visiting schools and youth programs, meeting a few of the three million children who accompanied them on their journey via the internet. When I was a teenager, I was expelled from the Boy Scouts of America. To feel the pain and stigma of discrimination is something that I would never wish on any young person. So it made me especially happy to learn that the Girl Scouts of America had designed a program to coincide with Anne Bancroft's Antarctic journey. People in our community have a lot to offer America's youth. The Campfire Boys and Girls, the National 4-H Council, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and the Girl Scouts all prohibit discrimination against gay men and lesbians. For more information, log on to the In the Life website at InTheLifeTV.org. I'm James Dale, and you're watching In The Life. From all of us at In The Life, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next month.
In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Richard M. and Peggy Danziger. Agnes Gund and Daniel Shapiro. Fred P. Hochberg and Tom Healy. William J. Resnick. Rick Wyland. The Rainbow Endowment. The Reed Williams Foundation. The Mitchell Gold Company in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice. Beaulieu Vineyard, celebrating over 100 years of passionate winemaking and proudly supporting In the Life. Beaulieu Vineyard, Rutherford, California. And the annual support of In the Life members like you.